Good afternoon. Hello. My name is Sonal Shukla, and I'm the Assistant Director of Programming and Education at the American Writers Museum. Welcome to the American Writers Festival and to this event. As the founding, di founding director of the National Black, Black Writers Conference in 1986, Elizabeth Nunes promoted the exploration of emerging themes, trends, and issues in black American literature and helped set the stage for thousands of writers, readers, scholars, and editors to experience American writing through the works of its most prominent black authors. An immigrant from Trinidad, she is a distinguished professor at Hunter College and an award-winning author of seven novels, Anna in Between, Prospero's Daughter, New York Times Editor's Choice, 2006 Novel of the Year, Black Issues Book Review. Grace, Discretion, shortlisted for Hurston Wright Legacy Award, Bruce Hibiscus American Book Award, Beyond the Limbo Silence Independent Publishers Award, and When Rocks Dance. She's here to talk about her new novel, Now Lila Knows, with American Library Association's Booklist Adult Books editor, Donna Seaman, an advisor to the American Writers Museum and to this festival. Welcome you both. Thanks for being here in this beautiful hall. It's so inspiring. I'm thrilled to be here with Elizabeth Nunes to talk to her about her new novel, which comes out shortly. You have a microphone over there, Elizabeth. So I thought we would begin. Yes, I believe it's on. Um, I thought we would begin with you summarizing your novel so when we are discussing it, people have an idea of what we're talking about. Okay, do I have the mic on? Yes, yes. Um, the title of this novel is Now Lila Knows, and I dedicated the novel to one of my granddaughters in which I say, now Savannah knows. So of course Savannah asked me, what is it she knows? <laughs> What is it uh, um, that now Lila knows? I suppose one can read this novel as an immigrant novel, um, but that's not exactly what my main goal is. There are two epigraphs to this novel, one by um, Martin Luther King Jr. and the other by Eile Wiesel. And both epigraphs speak about the importance of speaking, or rather, the, what's wrong about being silent when you see something horrible happen, when there is injustice. These lights are coming at me, <laughs> so it's, it's really, you know, there's some way, so I can barely see you. I think if I do this, I can see you. Good. That's it. So. Um, for the immigrant, this is ramped up, because for an, for an American citizen, if you see injustice, you have a choice. You could either stay on the sidelines or you can get involved. The immigrant has a million and one reasons not to get involved. Um, and is that correct? Is that not correct? So the novel begins with something that I had heard about, that I had read about. Uh, a black man was giving CPR to a white woman in a pretty nice neighborhood. And of course, giving CPR to her, his mouth is on her mouth, and she is lying on the ground. Um, she was overdosing, but the police did not think that was what she was doing. They thought that the black man was accosting her and they shot him fatally. That story never got in the newspaper as far as I'm concerned, but it got in my head. <laughs> and I never forgot it. It just, it just was just such an awful, awful thing. And this was way before we had these series of um, recorded, not to say that these things didn't happen, but they weren't recorded. But this was before before we started having these recordings, but somehow I got to know this story. 
So my novel begins with that. And the issue is there is an immigrant coming to the United States who witnesses this. What does she do? Is she a, does she go to the police as a witness or does she have a million and one reasons to not get involved? And then I just wanna add one more thing. I have narrowed the audience for this book, meaning that it is between the African American community and the black immigrant. And I wanted to explore that both groups are black. What are the feelings of one to the other? What are the expectations of one to the other? A woman, my book won't be out until, oh, it's there, I just signed copies. But the official date of the book is June 7th. And my agent gave me a letter from someone I respected a lot. And she said all the things I wanted her to say about um, these two communities relating to each other. So about that, is that enough? Yes, I think that's <laughs> wonderful, Elizabeth, thank you. Yes. Um, yeah. So, <laughs> yeah. I think this book is of interest to everyone, whatever our background. I am curious about the autobiographical elements to your protagonist, Lila. You yourself came from the Caribbean, from Trinidad. You had an experience. So this novel is set in Vermont in a small liberal arts college mm -hmm. where there are maybe four black faculty left That's after the, op the sh really shattering opening scene, by the way. Um, you had a similar experience as a student when you went to college in Wisconsin, I believe? Yes. Um, I think a lot of writers, mine, I've been writing a long time. <laughs> you know, I have many novels I've been writing a long time. And it took me a long time to write this particular novel. And I guess in a sense it is autobiographical, not in actual detail, but in feeling. And that is that although I have been here in America a long time, although I began teaching at Medgavers, which is a predominantly black college of the City University of New York, Although I was married to an African-American, um, although I lived in an African-American community in Long Island, I still was being treated as an outsider. I still couldn't fit in, no matter what I did. And I did a number of things. Among the things was I had Caribbean friends and families who decided to live in their own enclave. So they had their Caribbean music, the Caribbean food. They, but I kept insisting that I wanted to be part of the African-American community. And I am not saying that I wasn't welcome. I was welcome. But I always, also knew I was excluded from certain conversations. There were certain conversations. There were certain moments. Now, I have a son who was born in America, and he isn't excluded. He's African-American. So he gets the inside thing that I don't get. So for a long time, I had, I waffled between resentment and, um, and a longing. And I have to say that my family couldn't quite understand why I had this longing. And they would tease me like, you don't know how to cook any more Trinidad food. Because of course I'm cooking African-American food. I was married to an African-American in that African-American community. And they would say, you don't know the latest Calypso. Or they would say, you can't dance any more like that. Um, why don't you come and join us? So in this novel, now Lila knows, what is it I should have known? What was it, what was missing? And I can just shortcut that if you don't mind. Oh, go ahead. 
I think what goes wrong in America is that Americans do not tell immigrants the story. They do not tell them. So immigrants feel that they could come to America, by and large, I was an accidental immigrant, so I mean, I didn't necessarily come for economy. I came for the freedom of a woman. You know, I, I was living a pretty good life in Trinidad, but I wanted to be more than that. I wanted to have a career, and this gave me the chance. But most immigrants come here to make money, to make a better life for that. And they don't understand the story of America, especially immigrants of color. And I kind of go on the bandwagon about this. That the civil rights movement was in 1964. And do you know what happened in 65? Anybody? Well, in 65 was the Immigration Act. And do you know what the Immigration Act was? It, met, it removed country of origin as a criterion for coming in this country. Do you understand? Do you see the connection? In 64, the fight was to give African Americans their civil rights, which was a long fight, okay? One year later, that fight said, we're gonna give civil rights to all immigrants. Before that, it is not a surprise. You can just go look at the statistics if you want to. Before that, quotas were for Northern Europe. You weren't having people come from Africa or from China or from India or from the Middle East. Go back and look at your history and you will see it. The quotas were very small and they were for specific positions. When 65 came, they removed country of origin as a criterion for coming in the country. Why don't they make this? Why don't they understand? Why don't they see that connection? So, to go back to my personal history, I think that was in the heart of the African Americans that I was trying to identify with. They weren't telling it to me, but they were saying to me in, indirectly, do you know how you got here? And I just think, I wrote this novel, Now Lila Knows, is that now Lila knows. She knows the story about immigrants of color. And I'm not only talking about black immigrants, by the way. I am talking about immigrants from Latin America, from India, from China, from all countries that are not Northern Europeans. That is 1965. That is the Immigration Act of 1965 that removed country of origin as a criterion from coming into this country. And that act is directly connected to the 1964 Civil Rights Act, which is directly connected to the decades of African Americans fighting for their life. That's what the novel is about. Yes, um, really a wonderful context you just established. And there's a very poignant moment, fairly early in the book, where Lila asks, is it more important to be black than to be a Caribbean woman? So Lila really struggles with these two conflicting identities that she hadn't anticipated. And her fellow faculty members kind of respond to her in very, I found, surprising ways. So I wonder if you could talk about those characters and the dynamics between Lila and the four other um, African-American faculty members. Uh, could you just go back a little bit to, to add? Uh, yeah, it's hard to hear in here. Yeah. Um, so 
there's a moment where Lila says, is it more important to be black than to be a Caribbean woman? And she yeah. talks about how she was a brown girl at home yeah. and she arrives in America and suddenly she's black in a, in a way very different from where she grew up. Mm -hmm. And that this creates sort of a barrier between her and the very few black faculty members mm -hmm. she's working with. Okay, so about 10 days ago, I was with my family in the Caribbean. It's a different story. It's a totally different story. Um, not that we don't have all those other problems, but it's not as sharp as it is in America. You know, you kind of have to choose sides in America. Um, and my personal story is I didn't want to choose sides, <laughs> you know? Um, so, the early generation, the, well, a certain social class of Caribbean people who are black, meaning that they are not white, don't like that definition of being called black. What do you mean? Um, because the Caribbean is made up of islands, it's almost impossible for somebody to be purely ethnically something. If I tell you there are 11 of us in my family, we look like the United Nations. We absolutely look like the United Nations. My eldest sister is married to a Chinese, a Chinese Trinidadian. So her children look like they could be Chinese. My, two of my brothers are married to Indians. Their family came from India. They're not mixed, but they married my siblings, so there's that. And so you go on and go on. I was the only one of the 11 of us who married a foreigner. One of my sisters is married to a Lebanese, but he's a Lebanese Caribbean man. man. One of my sisters is married to a mixed Portuguese man, but he's a Portuguese Caribbean man. Do you get the idea? So it has become almost impossible if you just look at my family on the table. So, and I was just with them. And I'm thinking, how do you decide? Of course, in America, it's a political decision. It is a political decision. You're either with me or you're against me. You cannot be on the sidelines. Because when you are on the sidelines, you are in a dangerous position. You are allowing this to happen. And that's the epigraphs that I use by um, Martin Luther King and by Eile Wiesel, talking about the dangerous position of keeping silence. You have to get involved. So to ask your question, it took me a long time. It did take me personally a long time to say, I'm black. I found all kinds of ways. I'm a Caribbean, I'm this. You know, I'm used to sing this rhythm, this song, which is in the novel. Uh, I'm a brown girl in a ring, tra la 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 la. I'm a brown girl in a ring. And then, sweet like a sugar and a plum, plum, plum. So the brown girl is sweet and it's beautiful, you know? I'm not ready to let that go. But I have to, and I did. Um, you have to decide. Um, which side? And to me, ultimately, I have come to the position that we are all not a popular thought. I know it's not a popular thought. I have a hard time using the word race because I think there's only one race, the human race. And I, I know I get in trouble with that but I do everything to see everybody as the same as me. <laughs> Although I understand the politics, I do understand the politics, so I know which side I have to choose. So that leads me to a question about literature. You have devoted your life to literature. Lila gets this visiting professorship due to an essay she wrote about The Tempest. And I wonder if you could talk a bit about uh, literature as a force for unifying people 
and um, talk about the Tempest and the Caribbean interpretations of Caliban. I see myself in a sense of being very fortunate. I read books, I write about books, I write books, I teach books, and that's what I've done my entire life. Um, I am a professor. Um, I had to go through all the steps of being a professor, which meant I had to publish monographs in literary, in scholarly journals. I had to make those kinds of presentations. I teach literature. I teach creative writing. I write writing. Um, I am I don't want to tell you my age right now, but I'm pretty up there. And I can tell you, I probably read a novel a week. And have always done that. Right now, I'm rereading. I just said to someone just now, I just reread Moby Dick. Um, I just immerse myself in literature, which I find a lot of solace from. Um, as it goes to The Tempest, I'm not going to deify Shakespeare, but I'm going to say that at the time he was writing, it's just like we are now curious about um, what's in space. Is there somebody in space? Well, that was the Renaissance period, and they didn't know much about the, the, what they call the new world. So just like any writer, he is going to write about what he thinks is the new world what he thinks those creatures are. So when you read Othello, for example, you'll hear them having all kinds of notions of what Othello's people are. But people in the Caribbean are drawn to this novel, The Tempest. And I am drawn to it also. And perhaps what you are talking about is a novel that I've written that has gotten a lot of cachet all over the place called Prospero's Daughter. And I just think it's, I think, I think this is the thing about writers. We overshoot ourselves. We're kind of like, we surprise ourselves. That we could be, I mean, sometimes I go back and I read what I write and I say, did I write this? Um, because it's kind of like a gift. And I'm putting, I'm not comparing myself to Shakespeare, but I'm saying that, Shakespeare had that kind of, I can see this happening to him as he imagined this. He imagines a European coming on an island. And it has to be a warm island. And so people in the Caribbean say, oh, he's writing about my island. And very shortly after that, which was of interest to me, um, he decides to enslave, not shortly, 12 years later, he decided to enslave Caliban. And he has all kinds of reasons for enslaving Caliban, the greatest of which is that he thinks Caliban tried to um, rape his daughter. But he doesn't say he raped her. He just says he tried to dishonor her. Um, so we are really interested in that. And then this Prospero begins to define Caliban in ways that are just horrible. So I talk about, I grew up in colonial Trinidad, and I'm sitting in my classroom, and my teacher, we, I went to what would be equivalent uh, as a prep school, so all my teachers were Europeans. It's really weird. <laughs> so <laughs> to be in your own island, and this is happening to you, and of course, in order to maintain colonialism, you have to understand the power of books. I was talking about that this morning. Books are very powerful, very powerful. And nobody knew them better than the English. And any of you who have experienced colonialism know that they only teach their books to the students. So I didn't know anything about anybody's books, anybody's books, including American literature. But I knew British literature from one end to the other end. 
Not only did I know it, we had to memorize Chaucer's Canterbury Tales in Middle English. And I could tell you how it begins, the whole beginning. John Keats, I learned all his odes by heart. I am talking about high school. Shakespeare's plays one end to the other. His soliloquies come and stand up in front of the class and read it. That is how colonialism works. It works with books. So are you surprised that people are talking about banning books? They know what they are talking about. You can make a little island, and England is a little island, where the Prime Minister says, Churchill, the sun never sets on British soil. How the heck does he do that? How does he take over all parts of the world? He does it because he's the people to adore the colonists. And how does he get the people to adore the colonists? He educates them, or she, because it's the mother country. So, back to the Tempest. I have a British teacher. <laughs> and my British teacher is teaching the Tempest. And Prospero says the most horrible things. He says that Caliban belongs to a vile race whose stripes may move, not kindness. You got it? Stripes is the cat and nine tails. The way you're going to get somebody to submit is not through kindness, but through stripes, whose stripes may move, not kindness. Who says that Caliban belongs to a vile race? This means no matter how smart he is, he belongs to that race. That's a very dangerous play. Because I am a professor of literature, I understand point of view. And I understand that when you read, you have to understand from whose point of view are you getting the story. And that point of view is Prospero, the European. But what did Caliban think? You want me to tell you what he thinks? <laughs> this is the smart thing about Shakespeare. The, Shakespeare writes in this lyrical lines, and then he has blank verse that looks like prose, right? When you read Shakespeare's plays, you could know which side Shakespeare's on because he gives his most beautiful lines to the characters he admires, and he gives his blank verse to the characters he doesn't so admire. I'm going to get back to The Tempest. Think of Hamlet. Rosencrantz and Gilderstone were spies who, when Hamlet arrives, they are supposed to carry this message to have him killed. They are in blank verse. So you get to the Tempest, and the most beautiful lines in the Tempest is said by Caliban. Be not afraid. This isle is full of noises. It is so beautiful that I put it in my novel. Because in 2012, England had its Olympic, Summer Olympics. And I'm sitting in my living room, and I see these British people on top of a hill in black frock coats and top hats. And what the heck are they saying? Be not afraid, this isle is full of noises. What isle are they talking about? What isle? Right? You want appropriation? That's appropriation. But they. They know, if you read that play, you know Shakespeare's playing with you. So as much as my, prof my teacher said he belonged to a vile race, they have to unpack the problem that the most beautiful lines in that play is, are being said by somebody who belongs to a vile race. So it's a long answer to what I play with over and over in my work.
Thank you so much for that, Elizabeth. You can tell what a great teacher you are. <laughs> so um, this brings me to another question that the novel really makes me think about, which I believe you have asked yourself over the years you've been writing and teaching. What is a writer's responsibility? You say that books are powerful, that they have impact. So when you're writing your creative work, what is your responsibility as a writer? I think a writer's responsibility is to the story. Point final. That's it. It's to the story. Um, I think, um, I know people say you have to have a message and you have something to, that kind of thing. Um, and I, I did have a mentor who said to me that as a black woman and a black writer, I do have a responsibility because there are not that many black writers. So if I get an op opportunity to be published, I should tell a certain kind of story. I don't subscribe to that. I'm a storyteller. I tell a story. But I'm telling the story. And I know that my beliefs and my thoughts and my philosophy is it's definitely going to be in my story. For example, at this point, I have written 10 novels, and I have another one that I finished. And in all of my stories, I have a reference to the Middle Passage. I, you know what the Middle Passage is, that passage from Africa to the New World with the enslaved people in the ships. I don't plan it. It's not something I plan. But I, there's no way I could be writing about these characters that somehow that does. And I'm always happy that it happened. So it's not that I'm planning it, but when it happens, I say, wow, I did it. You know, it's kind of looking back. But the short answer to that question is, I am a storyteller. I tell stories. My, I'm an, I see myself as an artist. My medium is language. So I have to massage language in such a way to tell the story. And what does that mean? I look at the music of the language, because language, as bad as English is, there is, I mean, Italian. I wish I spoke Italian. I mean, that has natural music. We have to work hard in English to make it sing. But I do make it, try to make it sing. Um, that's, that's what I'm doing. So I'm telling a story. I'm creating art using the medium that it's like. So just to say, I always say to my students, I know what I want to say. I don't know how. And I spend hours rewriting a sentence, rewriting a sentence, and I know what I want to say. But it's not, I have not made art out of it. Thank you for that. So. This is a very interesting novel. A lot of it takes place in conversation um, yeah. and dialogue. And some of the conversations I thought were the most intriguing were between Lila and her fiance back yeah. on the island. And I wonder if you could talk about Robert. They, their discussions or arguments raised some really interesting questions about womanhood, marriage, religion, and this cross-cultural experience that Lila's having. That seemed like a really creative dynamic to come up with. So I would say that in the many years I've lived in America, the thing that distinguishes America from, to me, any country, including the Caribbean, is your freedom. That sometimes Americans take that for granted. I don't mean the freedom to go wherever you want to go and that kind of thing, but the freedom to be yourself and to think yourself. And to say something, how, no matter how outrageous it is, and not having to pass what you want to say. So my Robert, who lives in the fiance of Lila, he's still in the Caribbean and she is in America. And she's just like he is. Except in that time, she begins to understand the freedom Americans have. In the Caribbean, we, 
I have this fight all the time with my sisters. I have five sisters who think, you know, what's wrong with me? But they don't understand how their thinking has been censored. And you don't understand how your thinking has been freed until you go somewhere else. When you go somewhere else, you would realize that what you have been taking for granted, what you think is just like that, you go somewhere. So my sisters are in fact free. When I sit on the table with them, and I, I ten, only 10 days ago I was with them, I got pinched, I got kicked under the table because I've suddenly said something that I shouldn't say. I don't know what the heck it is. It doesn't seem to me anything. If I were in America, I'd just say it. And I said to them, I get black and blue very easily. And I said, look at my leg, it's black and blue. You're pinching me all the time. I don't even know what you're pinching me for and what you're kicking me for. Now, they think they're free, and so my Robert thinks he's free, but he's saying outrageous things. You know, about the role of a woman, about race, about class. Um, and Lila would say the same thing. So, apart from all the problems America has, <laughs> I'm not saying America doesn't have a, a lot of problems, but boy, do you have the definition of freedom. The freedom of your mind. I think it's gone a little crazy right now. <laughs> I think people have taken that pendulum and taken it all the way into the ocean. But um, it's a wonderful thing. So I got Robert from my sisters, who are highly educated. My sisters are highly educated, very bright. They live in the Caribbean. They consider themselves free thinkers, but boy, not compared to me. And to me, it's because I've lived here. That is so interesting. I really appreciate you reminding us of that because we forget and we take it for granted. We take it for granted. And it's dangerous to do that because it can be taken away. Absolutely. I mean, we're having all these book challenges now where people want to control what other people read. All kinds of censorship uh, goes on corp in terms of corporate, the social media. These are all problems, and we need to remember how free we are and to treasure that. And, and, and because from the time you are in grade school, it doesn't happen. It doesn't, I admire this about Americans, I can tell you that. Because you don't realize that you have been getting this from the minute you were in kindergarten. You, you just have been getting it. You just take it like anything. And you think, I see it with my granddaughter, where she doesn't pinch me or she doesn't kick me under the table, but she says, oh my God, Grandma, how could you say that? You know, <laughs> she goes into, what are you, what's the matter with you? Um, so, so, I mean, as broad-minded as I think I am, she is, <laughs> and it's so scary to have that, you better fight for this. <laughs> you better fight for this. You better fight for this, because nobody else has it. So I'm also um, curious about what you're working on next. This, this seems like a really important novel in your body of work, would you say? The one I'm working on now? Well, this one, to have finished this one, this seems like kind of a milestone for you. Would you say that's true? I will answer the last question. Yes, it's a milestone, because I think it was probably my most personal, and I would use this big word, courageous. Yes. Sorry to twist my question, but that's what started me thinking about this. So this was that sort of, plateau, you know, a milestone, an achievement. What, have, what follows this? But, but so what follows such a... I, I'm missing what you said. You're I'm asking what, what follows. So after finishing this... What follows? Yes. Well, if I were a carpenter, I would be constantly building... 
carp doing carpentry. I'm a writer. That's what I do. I'm a, it, it's, it's what I do. I, I, I am involved in reading because I'm just in admiration for what people write. And I write. I write every day. And the answer to your question is, when I was finished with this novel, apart from, I mean, editing it, and I edit maybe, I write over a novel maybe 10 times, really. But when that's done, I'm doing something else. And the novel I just finished, I've been writing over God knows how many times, but I've started notes on something else. I write. So, until, I hope this never happens, that I lose my mind, <laughs> um, I will be writing. It's what I do. And um, the pleasure that comes from writing, you know, I heard Norman Mailer say this of all people. <laughs> um, and you know, this is many years ago. Someone asked him on the stage, what is his next book and what is your... I think I must have heard him say this 20 years ago, and it went in my head. He says, I write a book to answer a question that has been in my mind. And when I'm finished writing that book, another question comes. And that is exactly true. <laughs> it's exact, exactly true. I think, I think a writer writes for discovery. And the job of the writer is to give the reader that same pleasure of discovery. So that's where the craft comes in. So you're writing and you really don't know all the answers and you, you're going that way. And then to me, the revision is setting it up so that the reader gets that same journey. But when I'm finished, I have another question. And so I keep on writing. Another question, another one. It's, it's wonderful. <laughs> it is wonderful. You know, you quoting Norman Mailer reminded me of a, something that really stayed in my mind. Um, the British writer Penelope Lively. Do you remember her? Have you read her at all? What did she write? Oh, I can't remember the name of her books. Many novels. Okay. She answered the question, how long did it take you to write a certain book? And she said, my entire life. That is true. Is that true? That is absolutely true. Um, it's just writing and it's like anything you do of course it is the problem for us as human beings <laughs> that there is no pleasure without pain that's what unites us all so I am not saying that they, you know I didn't get it or it's Here's the problem. I am trying to make tangible the intangible. That's hard. And every time I write it, it doesn't come close to what it is in my head. And I am over and over until it gets as close to it. And, and then I just keep on going. So it's, it's, it's hard work, but it's wonderful work. And I think you have to have a certain kind of temperament, which, thank God, I do. Um, I love being by myself. So, for example, I walk every morning, and I'm always a little afraid that somebody is going to say, can I walk with you? And I don't want them to walk with me, <laughs> you know? So I do all kinds of, I pretend all kinds of things. I take out my iPhone, and I'm whispering into my iPhone, but I am not talking to anybody in my iPhone. <laughs> I just want them to know I'm busy. Um, so I have that inclination, which I'm glad about, that I like being by myself. Um, and I'd say one other thing. Um, I never see this thing. It's really, I try very hard to see that this is a microphone. But somehow, when I describe it to you, it's going to be higher. The, the, the thing in it is going to be bigger. And the, I just, you know, I, I see myself trying to say to you, four people came to this event. 
And I can't say four, I will say eight. My, my head is always turning on something concrete and turn imaginative. So in my family, and I'm pretty old, in my family, they always say, anything Elizabeth tells you, divide it by half. <laughs> Which is not good, because <laughs> they're saying I'm a liar. <laughs> I'm a fabulous, a not fabulous. a <laughs> A storyteller, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. I wonder if anyone in the audience has a question for Elizabeth. There's a microphone up here if you do, and we can be happy to answer any questions. All right, I'll ask another question while you're thinking. Oh, did you have a question? Come up, thank you. It's almost a simple question. Wow, do you start from inception to the end of the story? Can you hear clearly? Uh, well, I think back away. Is it better? Yeah. All right, so when you uh, come up with the story, how do you start the writing process, and when do you know you are done? When you stop writing the process and the... Say it over. Okay, <laughs> should I like this? Okay. Yeah. So basically, I wanted to know your writing process from inception to publishing? Oh, writing my writing process. process. Okay. There's, I'm a novelist, and there's a certain degree of anxiety because you're about to climb um, a high mountain, right? And it can be daunting. So my process is to make a lot of tricks on myself. Um, I, I can tell you right now, what I do is I figure out how many words are in a novel, an average novel. Somewhere between 70 to 80,000 words, right? And I do math. Before that, I would clean my house. I would do something physical. And my house used to be the cleanest when I'm writing. I, I'm just doing something physical so, um, to let my head go. And before that, I have an electric shop, pencil sharpener. And I'd be stiff and that. My pencils are all shaped up. But something that I know that I can accomplish that helps me to deal with the anxiety of something that is not a cup. So now in the last 10 years, I'm into words. So I count, I say so many words I have to do, and then I divide the words. And I say to myself, I can accomplish 1,500 words in a week. Sometimes I go way past that, and sometimes I, so it helps me because this is a, this, this journey of writing is, you, you have control and you don't have control. So how I help myself, I love reading, I love going to readings to hear the same question you're asking. And I, I write down how I remember Norman Mailer, but I remember a lot of writers that I admire. I, I like to know that they, they, they've been suffering the way I have been suffering. So whatever it does to help you do that. But I find counting words help me. And this book by Stephen King, now I haven't read a single Stephen King novel, not a single one. But he has a book called On Writing. And boy, that book book helps you lose your anxiety. So if you want to, uh, the answer to that question is read Stephen King's book on, on writing. You know, it just calms you down, you know. And then I do crazy things. Now, for example, I love opera. And I read, she's long dead, Maria Callas. And Maria Callas, this big, wonderful soprano, says, every time I go on stage, half of my mind knows exactly what I'm going to do, and half knows absolutely nothing. 
And I say, if she could say that, I can deal with that anxiety. It, it play tricks. It's tricks. Because you're doing the impossible. I mean, if you want to be a good writer, you're doing the impossible. I love those big answers. Anyone else with a question? <laughs> Asking if anyone else has a question. All right, I have one question to end. In this novel, now Lila knows, uh, Lila talks about books that matter to her. And so these are books that matter to you as well. And you mentioned one, A Different Drum, which I have not read. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that and, and any other books that were important to this book. I wouldn't say that that is a remarkable book. It is in the novel. But I just accidentally read that book. And I read it because there was an article about that book in the New Yorker. And in that, it's a sto what, is, what is remarkable about that story is this was an African-American who his first two books, he was lauded, he was whatever, he was supposed to be the best thing since sliced bread. And then all of a sudden, people lost interest in him. And he ended his life in his 70s, looking for food in dumpsters. Someone who had gone to Harvard, someone who had won all these prizes. This is a very fickle business. Do not get too excited because you won awards and you got money. <laughs> this is another thing about America. America is a new country. They like new things. So this week, it's new. But while, they are, while you are new, there's somebody else. <laughs> Here is a quote that's in my head. I never forgot. John Keats' Ode to the Nightingale, where the writer is looking and says, no hungry generation tread thee down. He is 26 years old, and he's talking about a hungry generation about to tread him down. OK? So. Um, so, yes, yeah, so this book, novel, A Different Drummer, the thing about it that nobody can understand is that he is in the South, and his boss, he's a black man, his white boss is very nice to him, has given him all his money, has given him a house, and one day he decides to pour salt on his land and take all his furniture and move his family out. And the question is, why? Why does he do that? And um, I want you to read my novel. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so let me make a plug about that. <laughs> uh, this is William Melville, Melvin Kelly. Is the, William Melvin Kelly is the author. Would I? I was just naming the author, William Melvin Kelly. So Yes, yes. Well, thank you so much, Elizabeth. It was wonderful to speak with you, and thanks for your questions. <laughs>